And then you can. Okay, very good. So why don't we get started? So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing uh, monthly Goose webinar series, which looks at issues and projects associated with global sustained ocean observing of essential ocean variables. And we'll start a uh, continuous series of looking at some emerging networks with the Ocean Tracking Network today. Uh, I'm Albert Fisher. I'm the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Project Office based at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris, and I'll be moderating. And for the next we'll start with a 30-minute presentation on the Ocean Tracking Network uh, given by Fred Wierski. After the presentation, uh, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. So I'll moderate and select the questions verbally. So you can start chatting, uh, asking questions in the chat window um, as the presentation starts. And I'll try to select questions that are representative, and we'll try to attempt to answer as many of the questions as time permits. Um, also, I should let everyone know that this session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be posted on the Goose webpage, where you can also find our previous webinars. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Fred, who is the executive director of the Ocean Tracking Network. He's based at Dalhousie University. And Fred, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Albert. And thank you to everybody who has joined us for this session. It's a very great privilege for us to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about this project, what we hope to accomplish with it. As Albert pointed out, we're called the Ocean Trekking Net Tracking Network, and we are a Canadian contribution to global biological ocean observation. One of the unique elements of this particular program is that it is built on Canadian technology. It's an area in which we are very, very good at, at building things that go into the ocean and, and do the jobs that we want them to do. So we're very, very proud of this and very great, grateful that we have the opportunity to expand this one out into the global oceans. So could I advance to the next slide, please? Do I have control of it? Yes. I have the great pleasure of having Nikki Beauchamp here with me, who is uh, the tamer of the, the web and maker of all things work that are supposed to work when they're not working. So I want to start with a description of wild animals and how highly valued they are. They're certainly one of the things that we need to do a lot more ocean observing of because they are the things that human interact with and depend on for so many different things. For food, both in the commercial and subsistence level, everybody knows about the global fisheries and how important they are. There's also an increasing recreational activity in our world's oceans built around these animals. There's the harvest through fisheries angling and also live release angling in certain cases. But a bigger industry that's now developing in certain places is tourism. Shark diving has become an enormous money raiser in places like South Africa and in Australia. You also have whale watching. So these communities on these coastal regions are making a lot more out of these kinds of activities than they ever did before. Certainly in Canada, Canada social ceremonial purposes for these valued aquatic animals are extremely important and we have to take care of those as a first priority under our constitution. And at the end of the day, almost all of these wild aquatic animals play some role, either top down or bottom up, in controlling our ocean ecosystems. Very, very important for us. Next slide is... There we go. This audience probably doesn't need to be told much about how much the ocean is changing and how rapidly that change is occurring. There's certainly a growing human dependence on the oceans, both our economic activities, but also to buffer land impacts. There is some place that the heat and the carbon that's coming off of our fossil fuel burning has to go, and we're pretty certain it's down into the deep ocean at this particular point. But a really interesting perspective, and this was brought out by Macaulay and all in a science article earlier this year, is that we are actually poised for the second human industrial revolution right now. Our technology for working in the oceans has now gotten so good that there is no place that we cannot go. For me, I think it really hit home when James Cameron built a personal submersible to take himself to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And if you can do that, to make a, a movie and build a personal vehicle, then certainly we can do it everywhere else in the ocean if it's economically feasible to begin to develop it. So it means that that industrial revolution is going to occur. And if you look back as to what happened to the terrestrial industrial revolution in 1860, 
it was correlated with a massive loss in biodiversity and the extinction of many, many different species. I do not think that we want to repeat that with our oceans, which means that taking care of these valued biological resources is going to be a high priority as we begin to develop all of these alternate activities in that ocean. And that means that we need more monitoring systems, better monitoring systems to put into the hands of the decision makers and the managers the information they need so that we can have the new development but keep the very old developments on which we depend. Vicki, next one, please. So in terms of the ocean tracking network and what it does, we are really about tracking the movements of valued aquatic animals, mostly in the ocean, but we also work in freshwater. Um, we do this through electronic tagging systems, and we use a variety of different systems. We have satellite tags, we have acoustic, i.e. sound wave tags that go into these animals, and in some cases in freshwater, we're also using radio tags. The second component of it is to link those movements to the environmental correlates. What is it in the environment that determines where and when you find these particular animals? If we can develop that understanding, not only do we get to understanding the short-term and seasonal movements of animals, but also we get the capacity to begin to predict how animal distributions will change as a function of things like climate change, and we can begin to make reliable projections into the future. So all of this is very, very important. Oh, we're on slide five now. If anybody can't see that online, we're trying to work that out. Ah, okay. So in terms of what we work with, one of the great beauties of these telemetry systems is that as long as you can get a tag on the animal, the receivers will take care of, of detecting them. And it doesn't matter what species of animals that you have tagged. So we, in practice, work with different species that are regionally important in different places. And some of those species actually undertake much larger migration patterns. Here is just an example of some of them. They range from the white sharks. Uh, bottom left-hand corner is one that was tagged in Mossel Bay down in South Africa. Top right corner is a bluefin tuna being tagged in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And in between, you have things like the American lobster, Greenland sharks in the Canadian Arctic, Pacific salmon, ring seals, harp seals in the Arctic. So if, if we can get a tag onto it, we can actually follow it. And right now, the ocean tracking networks, uh, network of scientists are tracking over 80 species globally. Next slide. The purpose of doing this is to fill some of these critical knowledge gaps that will help people manage the animals. It starts with fisheries management. Uh, one of the most important things that the telemetry can provide to your managers is a measurement of fisheries independent mortality. This has been one of the great big problems in developing a reliable fisheries model, teasing out the, comp the uh, relative contribution of, of things like diseases and natural mortality factors from the impacts of fishing and trying to project forward to calculate what your harvest can possibly be based on surpluses that you think should be there. Without understanding what natural mortality is, those projections can be fraught with problems. Second thing that you begin to tease out of this is ecosystem structure and function and social interactions for animals. Uh, by tagging a number of different individuals in a number of different species, we've been able to begin to look at things like social foraging patterns in seals, where they're going out and they're actually beginning to herd prey animals together. And this is increasing the capture rate of the seals and altering the distributions and functions of the prey animals in these places with concomitant cascade effects down into the ecosystem. All of this provides a much better understanding of where we are. Certainly, knowing the movements of animals is critical for the design of marine protected areas and also for endangered species support. If you build a marine protected area and its boundaries do not encompass the areas in which the animals are going to stay, clearly the protection is not going to help very much. And certainly for us in Canada, and I know a number of other jurisdictions, national jurisdictions internationally, the issue of endangered species and understanding what the habitat needs are is critical. Defining marine habitat has been a really big problem for many of these critically endangered marine species. The telemetry lets you get into those areas and say, where are they? When are they there? And also, what are the corridors that connect the animals from one habitat to the next? And are they predictable in time or does the ocean move? And as a consequence, these corridors move over different years. Our Investigators, collaborators in Australia, Western Australia, have actually used this telemetry 
equipment in order to establish real-time warning systems for sharks along their beaches. The way this one works is acoustic receiver units with a representative tag sample of various shark species, mostly white sharks, but also bronze whalers, tiger sharks, others that are there. And when a an tag animal comes into the vicinity of some of the beaches that are being used by the public, what it does is it sends a satellite signal out that then triggers an email that comes down to the beach managers right at the level of the beaches and tells them that you now have a large shark that's cruising the area. And the decision on what to do becomes the option of the beach managers, but they have the information in order to make that, and you have your early warning system. The telemetry is also providing research results for the planning of coastal and offshore developments, i.e. it is feeding in and answering questions that are coming in in environmental impact assessments or regulatory requirements when offshore projects are underway. Um, one of the Examples of this that we're conducting right here in Canada right now involves a new transmission line, a power transmission line, that is going to come across one of the exits of the Gulf of St. Lawrence between Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. There is some fear that this power line will be setting up an electromagnetic field may, that may affect the migration of certain animals. And there is also some fear that the presence of the cables will in some manner affect the migrations of snow crabs back and forth this area. By working with the project promoters, by working with the government regulators and setting up our equipment in these systems, we're now getting the baseline studies done as to what are the migration patterns of the snow crab up in this area. And then from that point on, once the cable goes in, we'll be able to determine whether they change significantly as a function of that cable. And if they do, begin to take remedial actions. Whoops. Thank you. Other kinds of questions are revolving around fundamental science. I'll give you some examples of that a little later on in the seminar. The environmental conditions and the prediction of future animal distributions, I mentioned that also as well. But perhaps one of the greatest gifts that doing this kind of telemetry tagging work is, is the engagement it permits for the public in ocean science. There is no group that we've ever spoken to that wasn't interested in knowing about the movements of marine animals. And the bigger and more dangerous the animal, the better and more intriguing, especially in the younger age classes. So, so this kind of a monitoring network is a really, really powerful public education tool. So I'd like now to try to begin to explain to you how this all works. And we're going to focus in here right now on the acoustic telemetry component of what we do. As you're looking at your screen in the bottom left panel there, you see a series of acoustic tags. A couple of things to take out of those tags. First off is they get small and they, and they run to larger. The smallest one that you see there is actually about twice the size of the smallest one that is now available right now. It effectively means that the tags are sufficiently small that we can get down to the point that we can put an acoustic tag inside an animal that is as small as five centimeters in, in length. So it means that about 95% of the marine species that are out there would be capable of bearing an acoustic tag now. There is a trade-off. The smaller the tag is, what you're giving up is the power of the tag. So those smallest tags are probably only detectable at a distance of about 200 meters from an acoustic receiver system that would have to be in the water to detect them. And the batteries in them are small as well, which means that they have limited time of life. So probably about 20 days for the smallest of the smallest tags. By contrast, the biggest tag that you see there in that same hand is good for about six years. And it can actually be programmed to last as long as 20 years under certain circumstances and it can go on a much larger animal. And it's also a much more powerful tag and can be detected at distances up to about 1.5 kilometers from a receiver unit that's out there. So there's always a trade-off. The next picture in that bottom panel, oops, sorry, is a surgical implantation of a tag inside the animals. We, for the most part, try to surgically implant our tags because it's better for the animals. Yes, there's an initial wound, but it's done under sterile conditions. It is done with good care afterwards to sew up the wound and, and let it heal. And at the end of the day, you don't have anything sticking out of the animal that causes a, an opening that can let bacterial and infections get into the animal. So it's much better to do it this way. And there's a massive and growing body of evidence that shows that it's really not having major impacts upon most of the animals that are tagged. The next two panels you see are examples of acoustic receivers. The one, the smaller one with the hand gripping it, is called a VR2W. That one is the workhorse of much of the global activity. 
it goes into the water, it can stay for a period of about one year in total time, uh, works 24-7, listening for tags that are out there, and anything that comes within range of it will be detected and logged. And if those tags also have sensors on them, because you can put things like pressure sensors or temp uh, temperature sensors into the tags, it will also log the, the uh, depth and the temperatures that the animals are experiencing at the time that they come in range of the particular receivers. The downside of that particular receiver is that it is self-contained and has to be brought back to the surface and connected to a computer to get your data from it. So effectively what it means is you don't have a chance for real-time data unless you have a big budget for ships and maintenance. It can go out and download it very, very frequently. The next unit beside it is an example of a VR4 acoustic receiver. This is the most modern state-of-the-art unit. It's got a big battery pack on it, which means it can be deployed for six years. It listens on two frequencies, 69 and 180 kilohertz for, for tags, although most of the world's tags are on the 69 kilohertz band. But it's also equipped with an acoustic modem. What that acoustic modem lets you do is interrogate and upload your data from the acoustic receiver, and that takes care of bringing things to the surface. So instead, you can just take a, a small boat over the top, put a hydrophone in the water, and upload your data. That reduces your maintenance costs and lets you have your data back on a more frequent purpose. The final slide just shows you an example of a mooring. You provide a flotation around the uh, system that goes down, an acoustic release on it, and an anchor that weighs a couple of hundred pounds to hold it in place when she comes down. The final panel is an example of a satellite tag, and I will show you a little more about that um, with some of our other species in a, a little bit. Now, the upper graphic is giving an example of how we deploy. Um, in many instances, what we're after is trying to create a line of acoustic receivers that runs perpendicular to the coastline and covers the corridors in which we think the animals will be moving. Each one of these receivers has a detection range, and in the case of well, the ball, ball of park figure globally, is about 800 meters per receiver. So if you want to create a gate that effectively will count all the tagged animals that's crossing a line like that, it means that you have to place your receivers within about 800 meters of each other in order to create that gate. So some of our lines are enormous. The largest acoustic telemetry line in the world is located here off of Halifax, Nova Scotia. It has over 254 acoustic receiver units in being spaced at approximately 800 meters, 800 meters from each other, and it winds its way across the entire continental shelf. And what it does is it picks up the movements of animals that come out of U.S. waters into Canadian waters and back again on a seasonal basis. So it's used for international fisheries management and for international conservation questions. The slide also shows a couple of other uh, apparatus in there. There are two gliders shown. The Yellow one on the right-hand side is a slocum electric glider. That's a profiling glider that does a soft tooth pattern, goes down, comes back up to the surface, goes down, comes back up to the surface. The red one is something called a wave glider, which is surface tied and derives its power from the waves. We operate a number of these in a number of different places in the world, or our partners have them elsewhere as well in the world. And what we do is we attach acoustic telemetry equipment on them. So they become effectively mobile receiver units. This helps us solve a couple of product, problems, one of which is there are just parts of the ocean where you cannot hope to moor on the bottom fixed receiver units because the fishing pressure is just too intense. However, a mobile unit placed in a fixed location for an extended period of time can fill that particular gap. So that's the prime, one of the prime uses of this. We also see a seal in there. Um, we've actually gotten to the point that we've developed a mobile acoustic receiver system that can be put on the back of seals. This is satellite link, so the acoustic receiver unit speaks via Bluetooth to the satellite communication system, and any detections of tagged animals that the seals encounter are broadcast up via satellite to us in near real time. So that is an effective real time capability. So gliders are also near real time as well. Thank you. Now, the ocean is a big place. So even when you put your receiver units in, in a zone, you're going to have gaps. The left-hand panel, as you look at it, is just an example of the OTN St. Lawrence, Scotian Shelf, Gulf of Maine 
network. This is OTN receivers plus some that belong to some of our partners. There is a dark red line. Do you have a mouse? Vicky, that you can. Dark red line that comes off of Halifax. That is our Halifax line, the extensive line that I mentioned to you earlier. That comes out about uh, over 100 nautical miles from shore. We call it a line, but you can see it looks a little more like a lightning bolt. Um, that was all about trying to avoid conflicts with fisheries. It was a two and a half year consultation period led by Dr. Peter Smith of Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans with all of the local fisheries to determine what the location would and should be of that line not to conflict with fisheries. And at the end of the day, the decision was that. And after one year, the first year of operation, to our shock, we went out and found all 254 of the receivers still on station. So it really paid off to undertake that. You will also see two other blocking lines. Um, one in the Cabot Strait, CBS, right there, that comes between Newfoundland and, and uh, uh, New, I want to, Nova Scotia. And another one up top between Labrador and Newfoundland in the Strait of Belle Isles. The purpose there is to provide gates that count all tagged animals moving in and out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. All the other individual red dots you see are either buoys of opportunities. These are national meteorology buoys or other, other systems that are out there on which we have at low cost managed to place additional acoustic telemetry equipment, turning them into stations that are harvesting information about moving animals. On the top right hand corner, dots are about equipment that's been placed on offshore oil platform support structures. So some of the oil companies here have been into this. But with all those fixed receivers, you still see that there are big patches of blue where you don't have a lot of acoustic receiver coverage. And that's where we begin to try to stretch it with things like the seals. So the right-hand panel that you see there, um, you get a picture of a gray seal on, the, on its lower flank. You see the acoustic receiver unit. And the, up around the head, you see the satellite telemetry unit. The two talk to each other. And up above that, you see the course tracks of 13 of these gray seals in one of the years in which we had tagged them on Sable Island and let them move out and cover the area. What you see is that they actually move into a lot of biologically active areas and they fill in those gaps in our receiver coverage. So it's a very, very powerful and cost effective way to harness these animal bioprobes to get more information. So in terms of the global stretch of the ocean tracking network, um, it's really a partnership and that partnership is erupting through a shared vision. Um, the various colors that you see on the map are showing you places where there are acoustic receiver units out there right now. Canada's role in this is to build on an organic growth of this telemetry capacity that already began happening in large parts of the world. So what we can do through the Ocean Tracking Network is make a series of strategic investments of new equipment being provided to partners to enable them to bridge together the efforts that are already occurring in each one of their nations into a larger network. And then by getting everybody that's involved with telemetry in all of these different places on a common platform for data sharing and with data formats, what you can end up with very, very quickly is an instant, a near instantaneous ocean tracking network that is global in its scope and will provide a global monitoring coverage. In this particular graphic, the color yellow, what it really indicates is these are places where there is sophisticated and advanced acoustic telemetry infrastructure, but where there has not been an effort to try to bridge them together into a network through data sharing. And we're trying to work on that right now. That's a big component of what we do. About half of our staff are really just in the data component. So if you look at Europe, for example, um, there is a huge and extraordinarily talented and sophisticated group of scientists. We've identified over 800 of them that are working with this compatible acoustic telemetry equipment, but they are not organized in a network and they're not organized in a way in which they're sharing data amongst each other. So a big component of what we're going to try to be doing through the Atlantos program in Horizon 2020, and I will mention that one again, is work with these investigators to try to build that data telemetry network. So in terms of our, uh, our role, we, we try to, to bridge this gap, to, to lead by providing strategic investments of equipment that empower regional scientists and also help out on that data front to try to develop these common systems and common standards. 
we're able to do this because we get a major infrastructure input from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, or CFI. This is a paragovernmental funding agency that is really focused on building research infrastructures and supporting the scientific community. We're one of a, a small number of projects that are specifically targeted to do this on an international basis. Back in Canada, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, or NSERC, and the Social Sciences and Humanity Research Council, SSHRC, are both funding networks of investigators that are working with the infrastructure that we have established in Canada, as well as with international partners, to do top-notch science using this kind of equipment. Finally, we've got a number of industry partners that have fed into this one. Clearly, the equipment suppliers that permit us to do the telemetry work, that is uh, two Canadian ones are the primary ones, Vemco and Lotet, are very, very important to us. But we've also been working with things like the robotics companies to, to bring together the Canadian manufacturers of radio telemetry equipment with the international manufacturers of, of autonomous vehicles to create these new products that will help support the telemetry community and in theory will provide sales for companies both on both sides of, of the Atlantic. So, so that is another avenue in which we'll look to the future is how do we continue to develop these linkages between the researchers and industry to meet the needs of both. And as we stand right now for the Ocean Tracking Network globally, we have over 400 researchers that are working with us in, in a variety of different places and they've been drawn from 19 countries. The rest of the colors that you see there beyond yellow are just indicating places where we do have coverage and they've been coming in at various different times and, and places with different relationships with the partners that have been involved. But they're all seamlessly compatible. You can see a pretty good global coverage with some, some gaps. South America is a big gap and Asia is a big gap as we stand. We do a bit of oceanographic monitoring as well. Um, we do operate a wave glider, which you see up in the top left-hand panel. In the bottom, we've got a fleet of, I think it's five now, of the Slocum gliders. Each one of the Slocum gliders that we send out is doing oceanographic work, but it's also carrying a portable acoustic receiver unit on it. Plus, we've been sending these portable acoustic receiver units out to gliders groups basically all over the world, and we're continue, continuing to expand with that so that they can actually provide the data that supports their regional investigators in the work that they're doing. We also have some benthic pods, which is the top right picture, basically an oceanographic system that goes down to the bottom, oxygen, temperature, so any standard oceanographic monitoring. We tend to do these things in places where we don't have national authorities that have monitoring networks in place and don't have monitoring networks that are in place. But globally, what we really try to do is establish our acoustic telemetry networks in close proximity and in close collaboration with national authorities for the oceanographic monitoring. Because at the end of the day, the scientists are going to need this data to try to understand how their animals are reacting to the environment. And MEOPAR is just a shameless plug for another Dalhousie project called the Marine Environmental Prediction and Response Network. Um, it is beginning to push out and establish global linkages for oceanography. They're going to start here in the Atlantic Ocean, primarily in the, in the North Atlantic, trying to link together the efforts that are underway on both sides into providing common platforms and common data, but also maximizing the use of the infrastructure that's out there. The OTN is attaching ourselves tightly to this effort because every time that we can find a mooring that's already going into place, for a very low cost, we can add additional acoustic telemetry capabilities and bring in to your mooring an additional community of four to 800 investigators that might be interested in animals coming through their area. And as I mentioned as well, the OTN has a data warehouse. We're building it to, to international standards. It has recently been named uh, Associated Data Unit of the Interna International Oceanographic Data Exchange. And what it is doing is providing the template. So as we collect this acoustic telemetry data, as we standardize our formats, there are a number of countries like Australia and the United States where it's already reasonably sophisticated and has developed. We certainly built our formats in ways that are compatible 100% with these two different formats. But we also provide data templates that can be exported to other parts of the world. So in South Africa now, they are building a data node that will cover South Africa, maybe all of Africa eventually. We have provided the 
templates and the support to help build this network and bring it together. And for now, we're actually hosting it on our servers back here at Dalhousie until they're ready to absorb it back in South Africa. And we're ready to do the same with other, other international partners. Over half of the staff for the OTN are just devoted to data issues and data warehousing. So in terms of the ocean tracking network and the shared global ocean, um, the whole key to everything we do is, is partnerships. And we're broad reach in our partners. We're partnered with governments. We're partnered with academia. We're partnered with non-governmental organizations. And we're also partnered with in industry in different places. Each group brings something into this network. And in turn, what we promise to do is share the data that we're generating back. We are a pilot project and system of Goose, and very proud of that one. We know that Goose knows that we need to do more of this kind of biological observing. What we have now is a capacity. What it does not address is Goose's need for the essential ocean variables, the EOVs, that will have to come forward. But at least having this capacity to track these animals is beginning to let the community begin to tackle that question and define what those essential ocean variables could be. As I mentioned, the Associated Data Unit of the International Oceanographic Data Exchange. And you saw an example as well on that green slide of a line of receivers that were coming across the tropical Atlantic. That is on the Parada buoy network, an international collaboration between France, the United States, and Brazil. What we managed to do was convince them to let us deploy our equipment on the entire Parada buoy network, and that has been done. There have been a number of heroes that have been involved in that one. It started with Paulo Nobre from Brazil, who made us the initial contacts with the Parada network. It was then Bernard Borles from France, who has been absolutely heroic in helping us get the materials through the, uh, the vetting system and onto the, the buoys and NOAA as well, who provides a tremendous amount of technical expertise to, to make all of these buoys work. I am pleased to inform you that after the first year out in the ocean, we have, Bernard has just retrieved the first six of our units from the Parada buoy network. We don't yet know whether there's any detections of animals on them, but we should know that within a couple of weeks or so when we get the, the buoys better. And over time, they will do the rest of the network. But if that does work, and if we are picking up these animals, that Parada network coming across the South Atlantic is going to provide a tremendous tool to the international community, a gateway of documentation of the movements of animals between the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic Ocean. Next slide, please. Now, I did mention that the Horizon 2020 program in Europe. There is a funded program based out of Guillaumar called Atlantos, and Albert Fisher, who's our moderator here, is a key player in, in that particular program. Our component there is something called the European Animal Telemetry Network. Pedro Afonso from Brazil is the lead PI on this work package. But the goal there is to begin to bring those 800 investigators that we have identified in Europe together and try to talk to them about how do we move this agenda forward to both get strategic investments of infrastructure in place that could serve you. And one of the things that we've been trying to make happen but haven't quite succeeded because we haven't been able to nail the partnerships down yet was a line of acoustic receivers across the Strait of Gibraltar that would pick up the movements of animals between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. And that process has actually started. We've begun by canvassing the network. So these 800 people we've identified have all been asked to fill out a survey expressing their current activities and their interest in participating in building the network. And we hope to host a first meeting of interested parties at the International Conference on Fish Telemetry that will be held here in Halifax during July of this year. Now, the map that you see on that slide is the Rum buoy network, which comes across the Indian Ocean. Building on the Parada connections, we have managed to convince the owners of the Rama network that it would be a good idea also to provide acoustic receivers into the Indian Ocean and provide the coverage that you would see with the grids that you have there in the Parada network. Those deployments have already begun through a combination of assistance with the Indian National Oceanographic Authorities, plus the NOAA people that are maintaining some of the buoys. And we will continue to expand that coverage out over the rest of that network. So hopefully within a year or so, all of that will be built. And that will be providing a great, great service to trackers that are from multiple countries dependent on the Indian Ocean. 
We also continue to do small-scale regional deployments. Um, right now, there are a couple that are pending. Uh, one of them will be going into the Cape Verde Islands probably in the next week, just as one example. Thank you. Now, I would like to give you a little sense of some of the, um, the data that we're getting. And this one is probably more of a fundamental science, but it does have applied components because here in North America, the American eel has undergone a terrible decline. Over the last 10 years, populations in the Gulf of St. Lawrence watersheds have declined by 90% or more. And the question becomes one of why. Is it because the animals, the adults that are heading out to try to breed, and we believe that they breed in the Sargasso Sea, are not making it down, which means that the larval pool is falling and we're not getting enough larva back up to the St. Lawrence, or is something else happening? In any event, it has always been a goal and a mystery to try to determine where the American eel really does go, although everybody believes it's in the Sargasso, has not been quite tracked down yet in the same way that it has been for the European eel. So a team based out of Laval University in Quebec City in association with Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans began to try to track the American eels as they were coming through the Gulf of St. Lawrence heading for the Sargasso. And a combination of oops, satellite tags and also acoustic tags were put in them. So the panel on the left basically shows the patterns as to where these animals were released as they came down through the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and course tracks as you came across the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The key take home message from this per first slide, and there was an embedded uh, video which is not working, so we can't actually show you that one, was that 100% of the satellite tag animals that tried to get out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence did not make it. Not only did they not make it, there was a immediate 10 degree centigrade rise in the temperature that the satellite tag was experiencing, meaning that the eel had suddenly found a home in the stomach of some warm-bodied animal. But 10 degrees C wasn't warm enough in order to, to be a marine mammal. So it was probably a warm-bodied fish. And there were two candidates up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence at the time. The first was the Atlantic bluefin tuna, and the second was the warm-bodied poor beagle shark. Now, those satellite tags also give you depth profiles. And by comparing a 24 to 36 hour pattern that occurred after the temperature suddenly raised in the tags for the, the depth diving patterns in the, those tags against the known depth diving patterns of the tuna and the poor beagle, it became pretty clear that the problem was in the poor beagle sharks and that they were the ones that were eating them. Now, this prevented, presented our managers in... Um, in Canada with a, a rather thorny dilemma in that you now had the endangered eels being consumed by the endangered poor beagle sharks. And while now it's better to have the knowledge, it doesn't make it any clearer as to how you're going to try to clean up this particular problem and make things better for both species at the same time. It also left the investigators with a lack of information about whether these animals are making it to the Sargasso Sea or not. So last year, they got really innovative. And what they did was they recaptured their eels in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And instead of turning them loose in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to swim across, they put them in a truck. Nikki, could you get the uh, pointer here? And what they did was they drove them from here in Quebec down across the coastline to Halifax. And the animals were released here off of Halifax to undertake their migration again. And what happened was they began to migrate out. And if I could actually get the, sorry about that. So as they, they migrated off of Halifax, the course pattern that they showed, as you follow the pointer, was out here along the continental shelf until they got deep. Then they headed due south. And they did, one of them was actually detected in the Sargasso Sea it, itself. And the data was picked up for it. So this is the first time we've been able to push, pull one of those animals down into that area and show that that's actually where they're occurring. So the team is very excited that material has been submitted and hopefully will be published in the very near future. Sorry, Jeff, we couldn't see your pointer, so I just wanted to let you know that we don't see it so that you could just describe things. Okay. Okay, thank you. My apologies, Albert. Next slide. Now, a second component has been involved in trying to develop new technologies that's going to make all of this affordable. It's fairly clear that 
bringing on the burden of new biological observation is going to probably have to happen with existing resources because there is not a mass enthusiasm to suddenly provide all sorts of new money to do all sorts of these kinds of things. Ship time is certainly one of the most expensive of the costs that you have when you're working out in the ocean. And we're on the verge of potentially replacing some of these things with the autonomous vehicles that are out there. So a key component of what we've been trying to do is get our wave gliders configured so that they could go out and actually do the tending of the acoustic receivers that are equipped with acoustic modems and upload the information that is present on them. So the wave glider, which you see on the top, that shows you the surface component, which is solar panels that provides all of its electrical power. You have your satellite communication systems. You have a weather station that's on board. You also on this one have a wave height indicator, which tells you something about sea conditions. All of that material can be pre uh, presented in real time. And we post it on our websites. And things like our fishing community can log on and see exactly what are the websites saying about the sea heights in the area where I want to go fishing. And is this a good time to go out there with my small boat in these conditions? Now, down below the surface, you have a tether. And you see that on the left-hand panel. You're looking at a wave glider panel, uh, the surfboard on the surface. And then you come down to a sled, which is not in the foreground, but rather in the background. It's basically a series of wings. And what happens is the upward motion of the waves to, to grossly simplify things, is cocking and flapping those wings because, uh, on the tether that's attached to it. And so what that gives you is the forward propulsion motion of this. And as long as you have any sorts of waves, you have the capability of moving it. So in theory, the wave glider is a perpetual motion machine, picking up its power from the solar panels and picking up its motion from the, the sled. Behind that sled, what you see is the tow body. And that tow body is the unit that has now been configured to interrogate our acoustic receiver systems. And what we have done is used it to look after the Halifax line. We had a couple of false starts where uh, cable breaks, other problems interrupted in this one. But I'm pleased to report that last November, we completed our first tending of that Halifax line that you see there using the wave glider. And it effectively took my ship time cost from $23,000 a day down to $250 a day in order to, to pick up all of that information. So you can achieve these massive reductions through these autonomous vehicles. And it is actually taking you in a direction where it's going to make all of this affordable and we'll be able to build on existing resources. Thank you. Last thing I'd like to point out about the OTN is that we're beginning to get a little traction and a little recognition. We've just had word from science that a review article on the use of acoustic telemetry and satellite telemetry has been accepted for publication. So the, the mass is building. The, the organic growth in this is building. And there's a clear, clear recognition that it is providing useful information to managers that is going to help us try to manage our, our upcoming developments in the ocean. Last slide, please. Thank you. So at that point in time, to, to close off, at least with my portion of talking about this, um, our future progress is really going to be built around partnerships. Um, you do that in part because by partnering on a regional basis, you're making sure that the regional needs are occurring because you're regional people. are making sure that this network is being configured in that way. But then by binding them together through data sharing, the global network emerges. It also distributes the cost. Everybody bears a little bit of the cost, something that's affordable to them. Nobody could come forward and fund the entire global network on their own. In the future, we'll be paying increased attention to maximizing the benefits from the from other infrastructures, i.e. shared deployments. We want to get out there on people who already have oceanographic infrastructure. And instead of deploying our own systems, if we can just clamp this on in addition to everything else that's happening, that's one of those cost effective ways in which we will continue to build scientific power and make it affordable, doing more with the same. We're also looking at the question of passive acoustics. This is, of course, a very important question. 
there are a couple of ways in which we can help with this. One of which is that many of our deployments are in areas where people would like to have passive acoustics. There is no reason why we could not be doing the deployments for groups that have passive acoustic systems that they want to put out and deploy them in association with our lines and bring it back again. So we welcome that kind of connection. But we're also very interested in that many of the passive acoustic systems do get up into the frequencies in which our tags are actually sounding, which means that in theory they could act as receiver units for our tags as opposed to these two specific units that we've been buying and deploying in the, the ocean that listens specifically for those tags. So that if we can develop the algorithms and develop the collaborations with those who are doing, doing passive acoustics, we can begin to extract information about tagged animals being tagged and uh, detected in certain places, and that will bring a lot of additional power. We have continued need to do better development and integration of data infrastructures. That will be a big task. That will be an ongoing task. It's also involving visualization. Almost all of our scripts for visualization are being posted on our website. They're freely accessible to the global community. At the end of the day, all of this is about focusing on providing the information that's going to enable the new blue growth while preserving our current base of economic activities in the oceans. I've been an optimist all of my career. I will go as an optimist to my grave, but I'm really, really hopeful that things like this will happen that will let us get there by chance rather, by, by design rather than chance. Thank you very much. Uh, Fred, if yep. you'd like, we now have a pointer, so we can ah. go back to the eel slide. OK. Yeah, just well, grab it just with the mouse. Ah. Uh, so all I was trying, what we did was we tracked and tracked, what the team did was track and track the eels around the Gulf of St. Lawrence, so in a truck, came down tiered to Halifax, and they were released off the coastline. Right, Fred, the eels then took off yeah, thank in you. the and, um, northeast direction. Thank you very direction, much for, for your enthusiasm and for the presentation. But also for they got out over the, the last around here. So I uh, turned the floor to basically came due south to end up off in the Sargasso Sea off the coast of Bermuda. Uh, so my apologies, apologies for that. To ask those questions and to start us off, I'll ask some over to you, Albert, about from myself. Um, so obviously you're you're really making a great effort in pushing preserving technology, and, and we're able to measure things that we we weren't able to measure before. I'm quite interested in this aspect of um, integration with other observing platforms. So you talked about using uh, moorings, uh, the Parada array, for example. What are the, the um, for the receivers, what are the, the power requirements and, and the weights? I mean, can you put them on autonomous platforms um, that have a long lifetime? How much, what, what is the requirement there? Couple of w different ways to do this one. Um, the simplest unit, the VR2W, that I showed you earlier, is self contained. So it stores the data, it has its own power supply, and it's good for a year. There, it's just a question of clamping it on an existing system with a, a firm mooring, and it will look after itself. The disadvantage is you don't have your data in real time. We have cabled units as well that can be cabled into the power structures of buoys. We have some of those on the Smart Bay buoys in Ireland, for example, another one going off of Catalina Sea Ranch in California to do that sort of thing. But that takes more time and it's more expensive for everybody concerned. And frequently many of these buoys don't have the extra ports in which to absorb a cabled uh, Newly arrived. Yeah, cable sorry, system. I had so, a connection problem. Um, it, it, it really depends. Can you hear me, if, you, if data is important in real time, and that's what's happening with the South African Shark Network, then you can cable it in. If it's not, you can just sorry, clamp it on simply. It will take care of itself. And I got it off. So I'm back on. Can you hear me? All right, good. Um, okay, so you were talking about. Sorry, you were talking about the two different types of receivers and ones that could be autonomous, but then would have to be recovered for uh, catching their data, and <laughs> ones that could be powered. And indeed, good. In the existing system. Got a little scared. Um, I was actually <laughs> quite curious. Also, you have another technology. You talked about the ones used on the eels, which is the satellite tags, which are directly talking not through an acoustic receiver, but directly to to a satellite. What's the what's the yes, lifetime of good. those um, 
those tags and what, what satellite technology do they use for transmission? Correct. They're coming in through the Argo satellite systems when they report. Um, in terms of their lifetime, that, that's changing rapidly. The early versions of these tags were good for a few months to up to a year. And that was one of the limitations prior to, to um, making a decision about whether you go acoustic tags or whether you go satellite tags. Because if you need to follow the ontogeny of a behavior pattern of an animal over five to seven years, for example, a white shark that may live as long as 70 years, and you want to know how it's changing over a 10-year period in its behavior patterns. You can't find a satellite tag now that has a battery that's good for that time period, and it probably wouldn't stay on the back attached as it was because it's not surgically implanted in the body of the animal. It has to be able to pop up to the surface and broadcast like signals. So um, you trade it off. Now some of these satellite tags are good for a couple of years at these points. They come in different models. The, uh, the data logging tags, satellite tags that will record pressure, temperature, other things that the, the animal may be doing. You can put a heart rate sensor on some of these things, are all binned on board the tag and stored. What happens when it comes to the surface, because it will have a very large amount of data over the year or more that it's out in the ocean, if it's successful for its entire deployment, is it can't broadcast it all through the satellite. So it's pre-binned and summaries of it over some preset time period are broadcast. But if that tag is ever recovered, if it washes up on a beach somewhere, then what you can do is download so it. So for the, 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 the um, receivers that you put on the Parada or in the tropical got. And that is an absolute treasure, um, a gold mine. You said you haven't recovered the data yet, so you don't know exactly The other problem with the satellite tags something to the acoustic tags see. is that they're bigger. What um, so what species would you, you want to look at an animal that's tracking in the smaller than the actual size of the what kind of the satellite are out there that, uh, and that doesn't work. The, the physics on. just do not work for the migration path. Okay. Um, we have a fighting chance to pick up white sharks, whale sharks, bull sharks, tuna, and then there's also going to be the surprises. Almost every time that we do something, we put these acoustic systems in a place where we haven't had them before, surprises crop up. Um, right now there's a array that's located on St. Paul Island off the coast of Brazil. You, you mentioned that it's quite impressive, the Brazilians. The they're beginning to detect from different countries mystery that are in their animals some and they don't know what they are. Ocean and they need to, to figure that one out. So we're going to is try there to help one them event that get in touch with together, whoever did the tagging. Kind of we don't know what they, that animal is, but I think one of the great big exciting components of what we're doing is it's part of that ocean discovery. Nobody knows, and we're going to have all sorts of surprises as we go. Very good. Every two years, there's an international conference on fish telemetry. Um, it grew out of a European effort that was formerly an annual effort, but the decision was taken to, to go global with this one. So it, that's been the prime forum so far to do this. As we get the network organized, I'm expecting to see more regional activities develop. For example, in the United States, each one of the regional associations is beginning to put in place a telemetry program. All of that will be brought together under an umbrella so called the if, Animal um, Telemetry there's a scientist Network. scientist out in my audience that's interested in and engaging with the OTN, what's the best probably way to Probably on an annual basis, the Animal Are Telemetry conferences Network a good way begin to, do that, to bring together all of the trackers in each one of those regional them. associations all across the country and pull things together. So 
I think that's probably where it's going to go on a national basis, probably on a yearly time frame, and then that annual gathering biannual. So we have a question uh, from Pete Furs, who's, who's asking a question about whether you've considered putting okay, yeah. the receivers on. Come, uh, we'd Argo be delighted to have you come to the conference. Quotes. Absolutely, positively, and, it's a um, wonderful way to uh, make connections with the global components. Um, on the screen right now, you have all of our coordinates to get in touch with us, and we'll be happy. We we happy to respond to anybody directly if they want to make a direct contact. There the issue is we would have to cable them into the transmission system in the Argos flow. And at, at this point in time, I don't have the financial resources that would let me do the developmental project and connect them to the Argos floats, but it would be a magical, magical opportunity to try to get something like that done. Right, yeah, the, the um, power constraints on Argos There are engineering are constraints. Extreme, we did consider whether we could build a cheaper model of receiver yeah, as well, something uh, that wasn't armored as well, to go out on kind of a disposable um, basis. But so something like an Argos float, since you, so you have plans to put, um, engineer them up to go out deeper and the deeper, right? we're actually going to have to re-engineer a lot of the receivers to go deeper than they can currently go right now. So that would be a different problem as well. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, it starts with the fact that we, we have a very good tracking group that is located in South Africa, and they have been extending their expertise up into the Indian Ocean, and also actually to the tropical Atlantic. So they Lines that originated out of South Africa are now connected to lines in Mozambique and Angola, as well as you come up. And then as you explore the Indian Ocean itself, it turns out that there are a fair number of groups that are doing this kind of work already. So there's a, a group based out of the Coast uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia that's doing a bunch of activities. Um, we have Red Sea activities in Israel that are occurring. There are groups in the Chagos Islands that are also doing telemetry. There are groups that are doing um, other, other telemetry projects off of Mozambique. So the nucleus of building a continental scale system is already there through these independent groups that are happening. And my hope is that by putting this global network in place, it's going to greatly empower those networks of people that are already working in the Indian Ocean and give them a leveraging device in which they can begin to build up continue building up their networks in those areas. So we went to Rama first because of the infrastructure yeah, well, that was actually, already fortunately in the last year, no, it has, has recommitted at that least was already short time to, um, we went, to keeping the tower array going. Um, so I know you come also, very much from the technological to Rama because perspective. We were steered but, away um, I'm from the tower track network in the Pacific because it's track under re-evaluation and nobody could tell us whether the, other data, the, which data, movies would be in place when. And they did not want to actually undertake that work at this particular time. That's an honest answer. Are scientists that are trying to develop sort of indicators out of the tracking data? looking at ecosystem structure and function or other types of uh, indicators of, of the way ecosystems or species are behaving? That is the hope. Um, I would not say that there's been tremendous progress amongst our network quite there yet, because we're still trying to figure out where the animals are going. And then are they linked to some of these predict productivity cycles? If we get to the point that we have that predictive capacity, then the next point is to evaluate, well, why are we finding them in these areas with this productivity pattern, but not in those areas 
with the same productivity pattern. So how, how do scientists how the um, animals are doing understand the representativeness there under of those circumstances that changes the tagging a certain population and only of giving animals. us about a 40 to 50 but how do they know how, how representative that particular where the animals are over the tag is of the greater that we need to learn and to factor into those kinds of models that could help explain exactly and provide exactly the kinds of indicators that you you need and I know you need them and I know we need them as well. We try to bring in other sources of information as well as do laboratory control trials to, to make sure that the tagging procedure itself is not in some manner affecting the animals and introducing experimental bias or exper experimental artifacts. So for example, you tag a fish in the laboratory, put the tag in, um, are you affecting the growth rate or the physiological parameters altering? That's done for, for periods of time, hold the animals, just determine that there isn't that kind of a problem. Now we have historical tagging bases that are usually coarse grained that flow out of things like commercial fisheries. You, you capture animals in one place, you put a, an external tag in it, you put the animal back in there and a year and a half later it's captured somewhere else and you know that it was in one place versus the other. That gives you some coarse scale description of what the movements are. It does help us to calibrate our work. If we're finding our patterns in the acoustic tag animals that are matching more or less the patterns that occurred with these historic databases, then that will help us determine whether what we're doing is biased or not biased as we look at our, our results. Now, obviously, um, tracking the other hand, we know that the fisheries data um, in these historical purposes, tag management purposes systems are also biased because they're going to places and, where and people those go fishing. And can be very the local, but I'm, I'm curious actually about the open ocean ones. Have you so, developed any um, relationships with, it's let's a, it's say, a trade -off. Um, marine mammal it's probably conservation authorities or once you get started, the regional fisheries management organizations that are looking at some of the high species such as tuna? Are they starting to use this technology, or do you feel like, I mean, if they're not, how do you um, hope to uh, convince them that this is a useful technology to to manage the stocks that they're responsible for. It is a disruptive technology right now. In other words, it's a different way of doing things than has been done in the past. And all fisheries organizations are brutally accountable to all sorts of different stakeholder groups that are going to demand, um, demand accountability for things that happen. So when you get a new technology that comes in that's giving results that potentially could change how you manage things, somebody may not like that. And somebody may question the validity of the technology based on the, on the fact that uh, it hasn't been proved sufficiently to their satisfaction that they could believe the results that you're seeing there. So um, what is happening now as more and more of the work occurs, as it's generating more and more useful information, is fisheries managers are beginning to embrace it. They're beginning to see it now as a reliable and truthful tool that is helping to answer questions. And, uh, we're in a wonderful situation here in Canada with an example with snow crab fisheries where there are uh, some questions about delimitations on the boundary lines between fishing zones and quotas that are assigned to one zone versus the next zone, and whether the animals are migratory or not across these different lines. And what has happened is the fishermen have come to us to request a study. They have been accompanied by the governmental scientists who want us to do the study and they've been accompanied by the government managers who also want to do the study. What that means is that the group is primed to receive the information. They see the value, they want it. Everybody's been incorporated from the ground up in the, in the work and it will, I think, do exactly what you're describing. On the broader scale, things like the bluefin tuna, many of them are, are being tagged. It's Dr. Barbara Block, who has done, done a tremendous amount of this work and many of her animals have been detected on the ocean tracking lines. 
both here in North America, but also across the Atlantic in places like the Azores. So that's providing that information to her, and she is taking. You that also mentioned um, when you know, she, uh, data she sharing in the world there. of biological. We have been in discussions with the Canadian issue, representatives when we're talking about, ICAT, about how this nas- might national work, and we've also given presentations. We talked about the, about the data warehouse and the service you provide to um, scientists in the OTA network. They're aware of it. Is there a movement? Do you see a movement towards data sharing, given the potential of creating data sets that allow? the posing of entirely new scientific questions when you're combining multiple data sets into one. In many respects, it's one of our raison d'etre to, to make that happen. The value of it to the individual investigator, I think, is going to erupt when they begin to find that they can address a lot of these big ecosystem questions and have really high impact science if they begin to talk to some of the other groups that are also doing tagging and telemetry and are finding patterns in their, their animals. So to give you one example, this Halifax line that I mentioned that comes across the coastal zone here. Um, we are seeing the patterns in the migrations of the different species as they come through. Some are following others. Some are occupying certain migration corridors. Others are following other migration well, thanks corridors. Thanks a lot. Fred, you call you it a disruptive technology. And I think it is. As we bring uh, those investigators together and really talk about that, what's going to emerge out of it is some descriptors of the ecosystem um, properties that we don't about, have right now. Uh, and that's well, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to the audience for sharing their data on the different species that they're working with and tracking with. So some of this persuasion Another, right now. Uh, Goose and webinar and the next one is coming up on the 11th of May and coming back to, um, sorry, we don't have the uh, slide up there, but it's about the ghost ship repeat hydrography network. So one of the most um, traditional and, and historical uh, observing networks of the ocean. Thank you very much again, Fred. My great pleasure. Bye everyone.